morning and welcome to worship. It's so good to see each and every one of you gathered for worship on this Lord's Day. We appreciate you taking your time to be with us, and we also appreciate those of you who are joining us online. It is an honor and privilege to have you worship with us on this Lord's Day. We've got a few things um, that I'll call your attention to about the service itself this morning. We are celebrating communion, and this is our second time celebrating communion in the post-COVID world, so we're just a few words of instruction. First of all, many of you are guests, and you are welcome to the Lord's table with you. All we require is that you have a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have one, please come to the table. Um, before COVID, we did communion by intention, and um, that is, that's not really doable uh, the way we are doing communion now. I, the last time many of you tried to take the piece of bread and dip it in the little cup, that that's, that's cumbersome and looking for a grape juice accident to happen all over your Sunday best. So don't do that. Just when we give you the bread, just consume the bread, and we'll give you a cup, and then you can consume the cups. And please take the cup back to your seat, and that way um, we won't have any log jams up here. What we're trying to do is maintain some social distance where possible and maintain safety, um, of course. Now, three stations are set up. These two are, are, are typical. Um, the one over here is for you who are very, very, very concerned about COVID. It has individually sealed elements. It has a, a cup and a piece of bread that are sealed together. And so if you are very, very vigilant, and you come over here. Those of you who are in the normal range of vigilant, you can just come here. So, and I didn't mean to say that those of you who are very vigilant are abnormal. Please <laughs> give, cut me a little slack on that one. I, no, you're not. It's, we recognize there are different levels of of vigilance about um, COVID going on right now, and if you are very concerned, please, we, we, you are, this is absolutely the safest, and I know some of you used it last time, so nonetheless, that's how we'll do it. Please come by row, um, that way we, so just, you know, one row, and then and let the row in front of you work your way front to back, so if you're up front, come first, and then go back to your seats, and, and then we'll let the choir go last, so that way we don't have long lines of close to each other. Okay? All right. We will we'll get through it. It's the second attempt, and the first attempt went really well. The only thing that's particularly different today is I'm encouraging you not to try and tension with the little cups. Other than that, you're, you're good. Okay? All right. Now, um, we're still going to greet each other and do that, but we're going to um, recognize that there are different levels of vigilance about COVID. So many of you will just want to get, you know, within six feet of each other and wave. Some of you want to bump elbows, but we're going to greet each other. So let's stand together and greet each other in the name of Christ. Yeah, I just called it. I just called it. That was good. <laughs> and be glad of it. I have a handful of announcements for us, and I feel like I say that every Sunday. It sounds like a broken record at this point, but I do have a handful of announcements for us this morning. Uh, as usual, I'm just going to run straight through them. If you need me to repeat any of them following the service, I would be happy to do so or even make you a copy of my announcement sheet so you could have those. Uh, so the first announcement that I have is that we are in need of a nursery worker. Uh, we are in need of a paid nursery worker to help out in the nursery. Uh, so if you know of someone or if you yourself are interested in that, you could get with Joy in the office for more information on that. Uh, we just need a, an additional nursery worker in there. Also, if you have interest in just helping on a volunteer basis um, as needed for special services and other events in the nursery, uh, please get with me after the service. I'll probably be in the children's church room running back up here. But get with me after the service or call me, email me this week. Uh, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about what that would include. And we're looking for a couple of nursery volunteers as well. So please make note of that. Uh, tonight at 630, I was just telling Will, I can't wait for it. Uh, I'm so excited for our community concert tonight with Will and Marsha. It's going to be here in the sanctuary and uh, it's going to be tonight at 6.30. 
Um, and so it's gonna be a community concert just really showcasing Will and Marsha and their talents that they have, that they've been gifted by God for us. And so they have a lot of songs planned and it's gonna be such a treat of a service. So if you know of anybody who is just who has been interested in Rosemary Baptist Church would like to get a little bit more information, this would be the perfect place for them to come and bring them to this. Uh, they can meet Pastor Lane and myself following the service or even before the service, as well as just hear from our lovely musicians. So again, community concert featuring Will and Marsha is tonight at 6.30. Go ahead and get the word out there. It's going to be a great uh, event for us. On Friday, September 10th through Sunday, September 12th, we have our Bible School Weekend. Uh, the ages for this are pre-K through fifth grade, um, and so we're really looking forward to having this event for the kids. We're doing it a little bit differently from your standard vacation Bible school, but I do know that the team has been very hard at work planning this out, and it's going to be such an awesome event for the, the kids and uh, volunteers who are going to be there with that. Um, and so we're doing something a little special on that Sunday morning uh, that I'll just explain a little bit. We're going to have VBS roll into our Sunday morning worship at 11 o'clock. Uh, Pastor Lane is going to bring a message around the VBS theme. We're going to have some VBS music. Um, and so even if you're unable to know the words, I'm sure you'll get a kick out of watching the kids do the motions. You might get a kick out of watching me do the motions. Um, and so we're just going to flow Bible school into that Sunday morning. And following our Sunday morning, we have a lunch in the Fellowship Center. It's going to be for all of the congregation. It's going to be for the VBS members as well as their families. And so that's going to be an awesome opportunity for us to connect with those VBS kids and their families who come for that. Um, I believe in your bulletin there's a little slip underneath the sermon notes. Um, you could fill out if you're going to attend that, and you can just place it in the offering plate on your way out. Uh, in the narthex, and there is one as well right here up towards the front, uh, just to, so we can get a good head count of how many people to expect for that. Uh, so if you know of anybody through pre-K through fifth grade for that Bible school weekend, it's September 10th through the 12th. We're really looking forward to seeing some fruit from that this fall. Speaking of fall, we have our small groups beginning on Monday, September 13th. And Joy is awesome and decided to put all of this information in the bulletin for us. And so all of that information can be found in the bulletin for our four small groups. If you are interested in those small groups, three of them require a sign-up beforehand just so we can get a good head count. The sign-up sheets are next to Joy's office. Just write your information on there, uh, and we'll be glad to start those back up in the fall. Again, more information is found in your bulletin. The last announcement I have for us is we are looking for drivers for the new church van. And so if you're interested in being part of this ministry, you can see Pastor Lane or Scott Amen uh, to receive more information on that. We are very much looking forward to, to getting that van, hopefully soon and prayerfully soon. Well, I think that's enough of uh, announcements for this morning. And so we're going to turn our hearts to our moment of meditation. It's in the form of a responsive call to worship. Uh, and I'll be reading in the fine print and we'll be reading in bold, or we'll be reading together in the bold print. You could follow along on the screens behind me and I believe as well as in the bulletin. Yes, and you could do that in the bulletin as well. So, the Holy One is here in the community of faith. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. Let us bless the holy name forever and ever. Great is our God, and greatly to be praised. Let us meditate on God's wondrous works. Great is our God, and greatly to be praised. Let us bless and praise God's name forever and ever. Great is our God, and greatly to be praised.
Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in a spirit of worship and grateful for all your many gifts to us. We come to you as children. We come to you as those bought by the blood of Christ Jesus, our Savior. Lord, we always come to worship seeking to hear from you. But today we come with concerns. We are very concerned about the unfolding events we see in Afghanistan, the terrorist attack and the terrible humanitarian crisis. We pray also for our friends in the Gulf area who are facing a terrible hurricane. In all these situations, we pray that you would, you would bless, that you would put down the evil that so easily can arise. We pray for safety for peacekeepers and those who are bringing uh, security. We pray for those who are turning the lights back on. We pray for those who are in harm's way in both places. Lord, we pray for those who suffer today. We pray that you would grant them your peace. Father, we pray for our worship service today. And all that we say and do, help us to honor and glorify the living Christ. For it is in his name and the power of the Spirit we pray. Amen. If I could have all the children come up for our children's time this morning. Good morning, guys. It's good to see you this morning. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you, we're going to have our, our children's church, but we're going to leave after communion today, okay? And so we won't leave right after this. We'll have a chance to take communion, and then we'll leave right back with me and Miss Rachel, okay? Sounds good. So I wanted to show you guys something this morning before we start off. Sorry, congregation, you can't see this as well, but I got this picture right here. What do you see in this picture? Three kids. Do any of these kids look familiar to you? No, none of them look familiar to you, not to you? Okay. There's pumpkins in there as well. That's right, Ainsley. So this is actually a picture of me and my two other brothers. And this is from a Halloween so many years ago. And uh, this little one right here is me. I was rocking the bowl cut. It was very, it was, in, it was in style back then, I swear. And so this is a picture right here. Gracie, would you mind holding that for me? Thank you. And so... My parents took that picture as they've taken so many pictures. If any of you uh, have seen my dad uh, when he's been in here in the sanctuary, he always takes pictures and videos. He just loves to capture those moments. And what my dad did was he captured those moments because he was proud. He was proud of us as kids, what we were doing. I couldn't tell you exactly what we were doing there. I guess we picked out pumpkins, and he was very proud of the fact that we picked out our own pumpkins. And so he took that picture and had it kept forever. And so they took pictures of us because they were so proud of the things that we were doing at the time. But even though they were proud of what we were doing at that time, they didn't want us to stay as babies that long. They wanted to watch us grow up. And as we grew up, to take more pictures of some of the things that we've done. And so have you guys ever seen a baptism before? We've had a couple in this church before. And so a baptism is... What happens is when somebody accepts Jesus and believes that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, the baptism is a way to show that to the congregation that, hey, this is the change that I've made. This is the decision that I've made. And so we do this all the time. It's actually right up there behind the choirs where our baptistry is, and that's where baptisms take place. But baptism is kind of like a baby picture, if you think about it. When a person walks out of the baptistry, they are babies in Christ. And I imagine that their Heavenly Father looks down on them and is very proud of them, just like they were when Jesus was baptized and God was proud of Jesus. Even though God is proud of us as his children, he doesn't want us to remain babies all of our lives. He wants to watch us grow and mature as Christians, as believers in Jesus. And some people who accept Jesus end up remaining babies their entire lives. God still loves them, but he wants more for them. He wants them to grow in a relationship with God. He wants them to grow spiritually, just as they grow physically. 
And I think he wants the same for us and all of our lessons and all that we do. He wants us to grow not only physically, but he wants us to grow spiritually and grow in relationship with him. Let's say a prayer about that this morning before we go back and sit in our seats. Dear Jesus, help us to grow in our faith that we may be children of whom you can be proud of. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. I'll be reading it out loud for us, but you could follow along on the screens behind me or in the pew Bibles in the pews in front of you on page 860. Beginning in verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. 
and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
In just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion together. I remind you that we'll come by rows and we won't do intinction. Um, and, but there are three stations. Please choose one that is, you're most comfortable using. But once we get past all of that, once we get past the logistics of trying to do communion in a, a COVID world, communion is an invitation. And it's an invitation to share in the Lord's life. It's a promise. And it's a promise from God to you that you belong to him. And it's a reminder of the Christ who came and lived and died for us. But in taking communion, we are also making a promise to God that we are going to live according to his direction and we are going to follow his path and plan for our lives. And so we make a promise to God only in response to the promise that God has already made to us. And so we're going to pray together before the deacons come. And as we pray, I invite you to set aside everything that's on your mind and think carefully about your life and the things that you need to lay aside for your sake and for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of the world. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we come to celebrate the supper. We come grateful to be able to do it where we had missed it for a very long time. Father, let it never become habit or just a thing we do. Let it be a reminder of the grace of the Christ who came and lived and died so that we might have eternal life. Father, help us to examine our hearts. Help us to surface things in our lives that we need to let go of. Are there sins we have coddled? Are there relationships we have refused to mend? Help us. Help us to repent and be renewed and restored. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. The deacons will come and then I'll uh, direct you as to when to come.
to give just a moment for the children to head out for Children's Church. Let's pray together. And now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, who strength and redeem. Amen. What makes our faith unique? You know, if you think about it, you'll come to a ready answer. Most faiths, most religions across the planet, will talk about ethics, doing what's right and what's wrong. And indeed, many of us have a common set of uh, rules that we say, this is right and this is wrong. Uh, I once saw a Jewish theologian on TV when he got on, um, was talking about uh, eternal life. And he said, it doesn't matter necessarily what we believe, it matters that we have deeds. It's what we do in this life that matters, and that's how we'll be judged by God. And his thinking on the issue could be shared by many faiths across the planet. But Christianity says something very different. Eternal life is not because of what we have done or will do. Eternal life is based on what God has done. We don't get eternal life because we are good. We get eternal life because God is good. Think of it this way. Imagine like uh, at the criminal justice, the court system, they have this uh, woman who's lady, lady Liberty and she's blindfolded and she's holding up scales and then the scales are supposed to be evidence and the evidence tilts one way guilty, one way innocent and without pro prejudice or anything else, she's just holding up and weighing the scales of evidence. Well, what if that were our life? See, the thing is, we have to tell the truth. We know that we are sinful people. And even though we try to do what's right, many times we still do what's wrong. And if I had to balance out everything wrong I've ever done with an equal or greater number of everything right I could do, I would be in a world of hurt. What makes Christianity special is the concept that it is not our deeds and their weight. It is God who saves us, not what we do. Now, Many times, the concept of grace gets lost, even in churches. And we end up, and when we do that, Christianity just becomes very heavy. It becomes a laundry list of things that we're supposed to do, and we should, and we must, and on and on and on our list goes. It's very heavy, and it's very difficult. Grace, though, lifts us up. Grace helps us to stand up, and we don't have to bear a heavy weight because God has saved us and he's forgiven us of all the things we've done wrong. We do not have to live in fear. And so most of the time when I come to the pulpit, I really don't want to spend a great amount of our time together focusing on what we must do. I want to focus on what God is doing and has done. But today is a little different because our text says something a little different and it might come as a shock or a little bit of a surprise. Two times in our short passage, the passage reads, make every effort. See, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning, as a great theologian once put it. We don't earn salvation, but there is effort involved in the spiritual life, and so we are to make efforts. Now, when it comes to reading the New Testament, the New Testament letters especially, they are like sitting in your living room listening to someone talk on the phone. You're hearing half of what's going on. And almost all the New Testament letters are just like that. You're hearing half of what's going on. The writer is responding to a certain set of situations to a certain people at a certain time and we don't always know exactly what those situations were. With Peter, what Peter makes clear is the kind of people that he's dealing with. Um, you might have heard this term before. They were called the Gnostics. And it sounds like the word knowledge. I mean, it it kind of is similar to that. They believed that they had this 
heightened spiritual experience with Jesus Christ as their Savior, and he has enlightened them to everything that's going on in the world, and now they know what it means to be followers of God. And part of that knowledge was, well, the body and everything that is in it is material, and material is bad, and therefore what happens in the body doesn't matter. Only things that happen in the spirit matter, so they could do whatever they wanted to do with their bodies. Now this is completely different than the Christian faith. The Bible teaches us that God created the world and it's good. Your body is a good thing. We honor the body. We don't pretend that what happens in the body doesn't matter. Oh, but they did. And they believe that that made them smarter than everybody else. They were arrogant. They believed that let them do whatever they wanted to do. And believe me, they did all kinds of things. Peter even alludes to some of those. Made them arrogant. Living whatever way they wanted to live. Carousing. Seeking people to have affairs with. And on and on the list went. And against that, Peter is saying, this body is good. Your life is good. God has given it to you. Salvation is the greatest gift he could have given you. And because you have received grace and because you stand on the promise of grace, there are things you need to do. You have been given the gift of salvation. And to your faith, Peter has this list of things you need to add to your faith. Make every effort to add to your faith. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. You are to add them and make every effort to add them to your life of faith. The Christian faith is very concerned about our character. What kinds of persons you will be. And you will see this at the very beginning of the Christian faith. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount ascends and he begins talking about the affairs of the heart, what's going on in our heart and mind. He says it's not enough to just not to avoid killing. We have to start earlier than that and work on our anger. It's not a, enough to avoid greed and accumulation. And we have to destroy the greed that causes it. It's not enough just to do alms to be, uh, before the Lord, but you have to do them with the right heart. It's not enough to pray, but you have to pray in a way that isn't seeking public re response for your prayers. And so if you look carefully at the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talks about how we live, he, he doesn't want to go all the way out here to what's right and what's wrong. He wants to go back to our hearts and make sure that we become the right kind of people. Because when we become the right kind of people, we don't need law. You compare that to what the Pharisees were doing. There were thousands of laws and regulations that people were to keep when they could eat, what they could wear, how they could wash their hands when they ate, what kind of things they could do on a Sunday would be considered work or would not be considered work. And it became so heavy that only a very few could keep the rules. And not even those who enforced the rules kept them thoroughly. It was a crushing weight. And Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law. The law will be fulfilled through him and his purposes in this world. But you become a person who doesn't need it. Because if you can live fully in love, you do not need law. So the goal of the church for every believer in Jesus Christ is to have the kind of character that is utterly transformed and lives fully in love. That kind of character takes time and effort. Why do Christian lives fail sometimes? Sometimes it's because we just never expended the effort. 
The ancients would call this the sin of asadia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, or sloth. Uh, the Proverbs are full of uh, descriptions of what sloth looks like. Uh, as a man lays on, uh, as, a, as a door turns on his hinges, so a lazy man lays in his bed is one of his most colorful images. But he isn't just talking about the unwillingness to get up and have a job. The Bible talks about our unwillingness to do what it takes to have a deep and strong spiritual life. You see, the old patterns of life are easily able to take us down and suck us back in. They can ruin us. And what helps us, what makes us strong, what helps us go forward and have a successful spiritual life is the kind of character we have. And that character is produced by effort. The Christian faith does not need any more brilliant people. We have plenty. We do not need any more talented people. We have plenty. But what we need a lot more of are deep people. Jesus tells a story. A farmer goes out to sow seed, and he throws seed everywhere. He's kind of must have an inexhaustible supply of seed because he doesn't really care where the seed lands. He's just throwing seed left and right. Some of it lands here, there, and yon. And some of it lands, Jesus says, on the path. Hard ground. And what happens to the seed? Well, it jumps up. But eventually, because it doesn't have deep roots, it dies. And far too many of us are willing to live with a shallow faith. There was a great theologian who gave a sermon one time, and after the sermon, uh, a man walked up to him and said, uh, Professor, that was a wonderful sermon. I, I'm a trained astronomer by trade, but, and so you take it for what it's worth, but I think the whole Christian faith can be summed up by you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the great theologian looked at him in response and said, Well, I'm a theologian by training, and I don't know that much about astronomy, but I think the whole solar system can be summed up by twinkle, twinkle, little star. You see, being a person of depth matters. And when the crushing weight of life comes, and it will, having deep roots in the soil of faith will sustain you when nothing else will. So often we think that the Christian faith is supposed to be comfortable. I assure you it's not. Now, it, we are comforted by the Christian faith, right? When bad things happen, we receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit to help us? Yes. When we are worried about the future, we receive the Holy Spirit's comfort to help us? Yes. When we don't know the way forward, the Spirit comforts us and lets us know that it's going to be okay? Yes. But that doesn't mean the spiritual life is like sitting on a spiritual easy chair. We have lost an understanding of what the world is really like. Just last week we sang a great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And there's a good line in that hymn. Martin Luther writes, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. Now, we moderns really get a little nervous when people start talking about devils. Could Martin Luther have been talking about, you know, forces in the world? Well, yeah, we're familiar with that. Somehow, some aspects of the world just re reject change, and no matter who's in charge, they tend to, tend, tend to remain exactly the same all the time? Yes. Could Luther have been talking about people? Yes. Sometimes people are outright demonic. But there are forces in this world that are beyond us. The Bible doesn't describe them fully. I think the Bible intends for them to remain beyond us. And, and Luther's world, words, they threaten to undo us. Do not think that the spiritual life is an easy chair. 
There are things in this world that, were, are, that have you in their sights and would undo you if they could. What should you do about that? You prepare. There are many of you in this room who are retired. And if I were to ask you, when, do you, when should someone start preparing for retirement? You would probably look at me and say, their first day of work or something like that, right? When do you prepare for what's coming? Well, the best time probably would have been many years ago. The next best time would be right now. You prepare. I've probably shared with you these two different academic experiences before, but I think they perfectly describe what's going on in the spiritual life. It was my senior year in college, a long time ago now, my last semester, and I had the single worst case of senioritis in the history of academia. I could not focus to save my soul. I could not be made to do my homework or to read, and sometimes I couldn't be made to show up to class. Apparently, I was intending on skating through that last semester by the skin of my teeth. Well, I was taking a class in Eastern philosophy, Buddhist philosophy. It was an elective I had to take, and I found it completely bizarre, odd, I, I couldn't get my head around it, the names they used, and then they brought out the pictures of the deities they worshipped, and I said they look like Smurfs, and I just can't pay attention to this. And I thought I would do what I always did. I would rally on the night before the final, I'd stay up and do an all-nighter, I'd cram, and I'd do fine. I tried, it didn't work. My last day on campus, two professors of mine did me an enormous favor. They told me the truth. Dr. Hale was a, an expert in Greek philosophy. And so he said, Lane, I want to remind you what you learned about Aristotle and the importance of good moral habits. Your habits this semester were bad, and they'll harm you in the future if you keep it up. Dr. McLaughlin was just... Uh, he, he wasn't that kind of person. He just looked at me and said, you're going away to seminary and you have a responsibility to people who are coming behind you to do better than you did this semester. They told me the truth. Eleven years later, I was working on a doctoral degree at Baylor University and I sat down and they said, you are now going to take your entrance exam to write your, your, your doctor of ministry project. I said, okay. Uh, how was I supposed to prepare for it? You can't prepare for it. What do you mean? They said, if you've done your work up until this day, you will do fine. If you haven't, you won't. In the 11 years, I had learned something. I worked along the way. It was fine. So many of us, when we say, okay, we want to do this spiritual life thing, we try to you know, read the Bible in a week and pray for hours on end. And while those things might be good or helpful, the truth is it's not the extraordinary efforts that make the most difference in your spiritual life. It is the concentrated daily effort. A little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. A moment spent in prayer, reflecting on a piece of scripture, connecting with the people of God, worshiping God, you do this regularly and over the course of a lifetime, and when the day of trial comes, you will be ready. But more importantly than that, when the day of judgment comes, you will be ready. The single most important factor, Winston Churchill said, in determining the success of an individual is not talent or strength, but effort. I'll tell you the same thing about your spiritual life. The single most important characteristic of someone who has a deep and whole and full and joyful spiritual life isn't that they are made differently than anyone else. It's that they have extended the effort, most likely a little bit of effort over a long time. The simple truth is if you're not willing to put in the spiritual effort 
you cannot expect a good spiritual result. It is true. So I come to you with the words of Simon Peter. Make every effort. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. To goodness, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, mutual affection. And to mutual affection, love. If you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective. All of these things are there for you. But it is now in response to the grace of Jesus Christ, the one who has called you from eternity past and calls you now, it is now your response to put in the effort to have the kind of spiritual life you want. What kind of spiritual life do you want? Do you have it? If you do not, put in the effort. And slowly and surely over a period of time, it will happen for you. Let's pray. Holy Father, teach us to expend the kind of effort it takes to be the kind of people you've made us to be and you've called us to be. Help us to be the kind of people the church and the world need us to be. For this is a dark and desperate hour. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is hymn number 309, Lord, I'm Coming Home. The invitation is open for anyone. If you've never followed Jesus Christ before, the invitation is open to you. If you have followed him but you have not made any effort in the spiritual life, today is the day. And the best thing you can do is make a public commitment that you're going to do it differently. Some of you need to become a member of this community of faith. This is a fine, fine group of believers who love the Lord and love each other. And one of the best things you can do in your spiritual life is get connected with them. Whatever your need, respond as we stand and sing, Lord, I'm coming home. Let's stand together. try that. Now, it has truly been good to worship with you on this Lord's Day. I invite you to be with us here tonight. We're going to have an excellent time being together. It's going to be a wonderful concert. I know Marsha and Will have been preparing for a very long time, and you know the music here is or ordinarily excellent. I expect it to be excellent again tonight. So come out here tonight at 630. Bring a friend. Uh, you will enjoy having them there as well. Let's bow together and receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.